There we go. The other classic thing is, me. yeah, we have sound. Okay, everybody's just coming in. Okay, welcome, Cyber Family out there. You guys, come on in. If you have, well, well, actually, it may be easier to, yeah, okay. I hope you got something to prop your questions on, prop your uh, little pad. Yeah, because we can, she, I was one of you to write them. If you could write them, and then I'm going to stick them across here. And you may have a question that, you like an impromptu or something and students you guys are welcome to ask whatever you like so welcome everyone out there I think people are beginning to log on I'm Lee Sankberry and today guess what I'm your hair doctor <laughs> um, how many of you are have subscribed to my YouTube page no okay today before you leave you will subscribe to my YouTube page I have thousands of folks that are, are, are checking in that have subscribed. Let's see, I think it, let's refresh our page. I want to make sure they're on. And they will be able to chat. Let's see, I think we're online. And subscribing to our page, well, yeah, we're here. We're online. So I have right here, we'll be able to chat and I'll be able to get their questions. Um, subscribing to the page will allow you to get alerts on my videos. Anything I do new in a video form, and really anything that I do, because I am going to to just send a. I have a great little software called Snagit that I absolutely love, and as much as I can, I just kind of talk to that and send a video of me speaking and my face, of course, and then I I just let you know whatever I'm doing if it's something like this event. I'll make a flyer, a video flyer, or something like that. But it, anything that I do, any event, anything that's any of the new video that I do, if you are subscribed to me, excuse me, I've had a long day, but um, I'll get it together in a minute. We'll all warm up and we'll just have a big party. But if you subscribe to me, you will be able to get a new alert every time I do a new video. I generally try and blog or I try to do a what I call a cyber reading at least once a week. So that's pretty cool. So I, I'm pretty excited about that where you will have an opportunity to hear me read my book, Black Woman's Guide. Well, right now we're in Black Woman's Guide to Beautiful Hair with series. Um, on the mind, so I'm, I'm excited about that as well. All right, so we're ready to get started. I'm Lisa Ackbeer, and like I said, today I'll be your hair doctor, and we're going to talk about this untold story. Uh, women are losing hair in this National Women's Month. Women are losing hair, and we're just we're not talking about it. I and the reason that why this is so important to me because I have patients who come to me have treatments they we have four parts to our treatments stabilization maintenance and prevention they stabilize do very well and then they they forget a lot of what i've taught them or they'll have these setbacks and they'll ask questions that just i mean really and i need my microphone just to make sure everybody can hear me on okay all right, I know you guys can hear me, but I just want to make sure they can hear me as we're streaming live. They'll ask questions and things that, for example, when you're a patient of mine, you know the difference between an internal or external follicular loss or problem. So if you're losing hair, you'll know if it's coming from something external or internal. You'll know that, but you're not going to know that if you're out there just, uh, you know, out in the world and you're listening to everyone, you're looking on YouTube. How many of you on YouTube a lot? Look at that. You're on YouTube, but you're not subscribed to my page. F, F, and I don't think about you. Okay. Um, YouTube, great, but bad. You know, there's the, it's like the good and the evil. It's really, really scary. So, you know, you hear a lot of things on YouTube. You read a lot of things. You see a lot of things. And then you, you, you come up with these things. And it's very hard to really understand really what's right and what's wrong. So that's where the frustration comes with a lot of patients who come in to see me. 
it sounds good. I can get the results for them, but then they're just like, well, hmm, just don't know if this is, uh, maybe it could be something more. But what we find is that people get off track with how they follow their program or if they, whether or not they follow their program or not. So I'm gonna try to scoot back so I can have the spot a little more on my face. There we go, and that way they can see me and I'm like a little chocolate drop. Okay, all right. So today I wanna to just uncover some of this. I wanna to talk to you about this untold story. Now if we look at some of these things, we look at like, let's see if I can get, yeah. And if you can't see, you probably wanna to move to that side because I have to stand here. So I don't want you, I don't wanna block your vision. Or your view. So when we look at hairstyles like these braids and there are others that we want to talk about locks and wigs and all of that, how do we get from here to here? Now this is what part where we're not understanding. We're not understanding that when you wear these beautiful styles and we have many beautiful styles out there, our, first we want to give it to the stylist. We have extremely talented hairstylists out here and they're doing great a great job but there's also a problem because hairstylists are not really getting the credit that they deserve they're not getting the support more than anything that they deserve hairstylists need continuing education most states tennessee included don't offer continuing ed how many of you knew that i know you're not if you're a stylist you know it but if you're not a stylist, how many of you knew that? You, there was no continued ed that was a mandatory for cosmetologists. So you go in the salon and you're like, oh, okay, they know it. And one of the first things that I hear from patients is that, well, I thought she was a stylist and she should know. And how many of you felt like that if you had a problem? I thought they should know. Well, the reason why they don't know is because there's no continuing end to teach them, especially when it relates to alopecia. Alopecia, how many of you know what alopecia means? Alopecia, it means what? Hair loss. Hair loss, but alopecia, hair loss can, that's just kind of, it's under the umbrella of hair loss. But specifically, what is alopecia? Balding. Balding, absolutely. Alopecia is the scientific medical term for balding. That's what it is. But when you, someone tells you you're balding, we need to talk about what category. So I'm balding, so what category is it? Um, what type of balding am I suffering from? That's what you need to know. And that's not happening in a lot of cases. Even when you go in to see your dermatologist or your primary care physician, you don't know about the category. Now, why is that? Because no one has paid attention to it. So when you think of um, balding or alopecia, where do you think it comes from? It comes from, I'll give some names and you can say, oh, well, I'll let you tell me. Some of you may already feel like you know some things about it. What do you think about when you think about alopecia or baldness? It comes from stress. stress. What's another one? Aging. Aging. What's another one? Hormones. Hormones. What's another one? Tension, tension, like stress. Oh, okay. What's another one? Chemotherapy. Chemotherapy. What's another one? Thyroid. Thyroid. Another one? Nutrition. Nutrition. And anybody else want to say something? Okay. What have you done here? You have given me types of alopecia or, or ways that alopecia can occur within your on your hair or head in your follicle, but it's all external, internal. You've given me only the internal, with the exception of the possibility that that may be both. Okay, so what we're looking at is your understanding is limited. When you have a limited understanding of alopecia, then, and this is professionals as well, we're looking at Alopecia as something that comes from within the body system, the malfunction, um, something's going on within some of the organs within our body system. Now let's look at um, aging. Aging, that is a possibility that you can, your, your growth cycle can change as you get older. 
It is a possibility. There are studies that show that when some families, it's all genetically linked, that it never happens. The individuals will grow hair and continue to grow at the same rate without any problems as if they were 20. My daughter's in their 30s. Their hair is still growing like it was when they were little girls. They're still growing at a good rate, at a rate of about an inch every four weeks. Most of the average adult for that rate will change. But sometimes when you get older and you're 30, past 30, 40, 50, 60, and beyond, you can have a change in how fast your hair grows from your follicle. So aging can alter. It does not cause you to lose hair. That is not a reason, but it's still internal. Um, someone has said thyroid, like disease within the body systems, the endocrine system, autoimmune diseases. Those types of alopecia can come because the body itself, somewhere in the endocrine system, there's a malfunction. It could be an indirect cause, like medication from that particular malfunction or within the body system or the disease state. But that's internal. Um, someone said someone else, something hormones. Sometimes, as especially let's do women and then men, with women, you can have a change in your hormones as, you're, as you age, as you get older, you're, as you move into menopause stage, you can have a problem or a change, and then you will notice that your hormones as your testosterone levels begin to rise and your estrogen levels begin to drop, then you will notice that you will have a change in your, your, the way your hair grows. Your density will change. Kind of a diffuse thinning. But that's internal. But the follicles have to be sensitive to that. I'm moving close into that area. I know you want to say, wow, you just look too young for that. I know you want to say it, but you go ahead and say it. But I am moving to that point. And so therefore, but I have plenty of hair. Okay, so what's going on? Why am not? Why am I not losing hair? Because it's not necessary. Your follicles have to be sensitive to that problem. In other words, you don't have to lose hair because you have hormonal changes. That's not a given. That's not always true. And we said nutrition. The diet. The body needs to be nourished. The follicle is an organ. No matter how small it is, it's an organ. And so that follicle itself. When that organ is malnourished, it may malfunction. All the organs need good blood, blood supply. They need to be nourished, and the follicle as well. Chemotherapy, but that's internal. Chemotherapy. The body um, hair follicle, that organ, it proliferates, rapidly divides, in other words, differentiate. This is a very quick process. Very quickly, the chemotherapy radiation basically goes after the rapidly dividing cells. Hair follicles one of the most rapidly dividing cells within the body system. So that's why your hair shuts down, your follicle shuts down, because you lose temporarily, thank God it's temporary, temporarily you lose the ability to actually grow a hair in that follicle. That's internal. So what about the external? There are two categories. Now, how did we get here? You notice on the screen, it says, how did we get from here to here? Now, this is something that you can easily cover up because I, I, by design, I put some added hair pieces up there because you can have a very beautiful hairstyle, but now everyone's really wanting their own hair. How many of you just want your own hair to be healthy? I mean, I mean, I can do weave and wigs, and I can do it, but give me some hair. I want it to be a choice. And, and now, I, I, and I did an analysis on, a, on someone today, and one of the things they said to me is that, I mean, I was just doing weave because it was convenient. And now I have to do it because if I don't do it, then I'm going to I'm gonna have a problem with showing my hair. I'm, I'm, I'm a professional. I have to be before the public, and so it's a really serious thing for women. Men, you can shave your head sometimes, but I have patients, male patients, who it's just as important to them that they have their hair. So I'm just saying, I said all that to say this, we have to look at these things. So let's take a look, and let's go to what's happening. 
preventable. We want to, I'm going to, I put up here preventable and I put all these dollar signs and you in the drawer and you, the drawer is smoking and all that business. But 30 million women are affected by hair loss. African American women spend over $9 billion annually on hair care products. Now, this is a somewhat older number because it's probably higher now um, on hair care products and services. African American women have the most cases of preventable hair loss. Preventable hair loss is the other category that we're going to speak about. There are two types of hair loss, and this is where we get into the untold story. There's internal, and I want to keep it simple without oversimplifying it. There's internal, and then there's external. Internal follicular loss, you just named several of them. Things that go on within the body system that cause the hair follicle to malfunction, preventing the follicle from doing what it's supposed to do, grow a hair, produce and grow a hair. Internal, and the body does not need hair to survive, so if something goes on within the body system, in most parts of the world, if something goes on with the body system, sometimes you can lose hair. Nails, skin, all those things can happen. But what about the external? External deals with things that are happening within the superficial layers. Okay, cosmetologists and students, what are some of your what are your superficial layers? What's the one? You got the dermis, the epidermis, and the hypodermis. Which one would be the superficial? Speak up. Epidermis. I hear you, Angie, back there. You speak up. There you go, with that soft voice. And I didn't expect you to know. No worries. I expected Angie to say, give me that one. Okay. The epidermis. That's, the, that's what keeps us young. That's what keeps us fresh. Our body will shed and get new skin on, it's on a continuous basis. In about 30 to 45 days, you've got new skin because you're shedding continuously. That's why it's so crucial to clean our scalp so we don't have that aging. Okay, so the superficial layers, you will begin to shed off those layers. Then the other part that's superficial is what? What's the next one above the epidermis? Above it, not below it. Above it, not the layer. What other substance? Dead keratinized cells. Hair. See, I was, it was too easy, I think. We were trying to make it hard. Yeah, we're talking about what's superficial. What does your hair do? It sheds away and you get a new one. So anything that'll shed off like that will be is superficial. It's a superficial layer or part of the external portion of the layers. So it's just basically keratinized dead cells. So your hair follicle. The only part that's alive, so when someone tells you they're going to cut off your dead, dead ends, then they're, they may have to shave your head. Because every, everything above your epidermis or that has emerged from your epidermis is dead. We just want it to look alive. Shake, shake, shake. <laughs> we just want it to have body and movement. We want it to... We want to protect and preserve it. Now, what happens when we don't do that? When we don't take care of our superficial layer epidermis, our superficial layer, our extended, the what emerges from the mouth of the follicle, our hair strand, what happens? It die, it really becomes um, to a point where it just kind of breaks away. It breaks away, it becomes polluted, it dehydrates. And it dries up and breaks. It's kind of like if you think about grass and you think about straw. Okay? Why is, you can put straw grass in your hand and you can do this and open up and it tries to open back up. It's moist. It's a it's you know, but it's dead because it's it you must cut from its root. But straw is dried out. It hasn't been taken care of, or a plant that hasn't been watered. So I'm not saying that. Our hair and plant, that's just my best analogy, so it may not be the best one. But I just want you to know, if you can protect and preserve your hair shaft, you can, and your skin, you can have healthy hair now and healthy scalp now and for years to come. Unless there's a disease um, that will develop within the body system, 
that indirectly causes you to have problems with your hair shaft and your epidermis. So I just need you to wrap your brain around that as we move forward. So when I ask questions about which is external and which is internal, you'll be able to answer that. Why? Because the hair strand is, right, the epidermis is the surface, the cornea, the top layer is, okay. So everything you said is internal. Nutrition, chemo, all of that stems from those problems, okay? So keep that in mind. I want to simplify it for you because the thing is, this is really huge for a lot of women and men. And we're like all over the place. Oh, I got a divorce and I was losing my hair. Oh, I was in traffic and I'm losing my hair. Oh, that gel. Oh, that me. Oh, that one. Oh, that. No. Usually what we find is neglect. When we get frustrated and tired and overworked and stressed, generally we find neglect and we don't take care of our hair and scalp like we should, so we have these problems. It begins to self-pollute, pollute. the strand becomes diseased, and how, is you, how can you disease something that's dead? Well, I'll tell you how. Overheated tools, overuse of relaxers, overuse of dehydrating primates. So natural hair folks, you're not gonna get away today. We're gonna, I'm gonna talk to you as well. Okay, let's talk about some internal follicular loss. So, when we have female pattern, male pattern, alopecia areata, intelligent, and inclusion, let's kind of talk about those for a moment. Female pattern, we just described it earlier. That's a, what is that? A external internal. Okay, you guys should be ashamed of yourself because it's a big internal word up on that screen, first and foremost. And plus, we already talked about it. Today, I'm going to take out the fat leg pencil and I'm going to hit some knuckles. Okay. <laughs> How many of you remember that? I mean, I've, I've been around. You'll tell your age a little bit, but I'm okay with that. We're in the first grade. My first grade teacher, shoot, you got it wrong. She hits your knuckles with the back leg pencil. Okay. So that's internal. That's an internal follicular problem. And that's female pattern. So if, if don't let anyone tell you you have a male pattern. I, I just don't agree with that. I think that we have to recognize female pattern baldness for what it is. You're female. Female pattern. Um, usually you're going to find it in the crown, as you see. You can find thinning in any part of the scalp, on any part of the scalp. You can have density changes. In other words, the hairs per square inch can ch change in numbers. Now, what happens with female pattern? We find that, I mentioned the hormonal changes. We find something we call diffuse. That means there's no real pattern, but we generally will have strands that are there. But you begin to part your hair. This is one way to test it. We have what we call like a Christmas tree part. So we have this part, and it begins to have lines, and um, I call them unstable lines when I do the examinations. That means that you're supposed to have a part, and then you have hair, and you have a part, you have hair. But you have part, and then you have lines, and a little hair between those lines. That's diffuse thinning. So when you hold the hair up, you can see your scalp. You straight through diffuse thinning. You can okay with a male pattern. Generally, we're going to find it on the temple area and the crown as well. Alopecia areata. Alopecia areata is a autoimmune disease. I mean, it kind of stems from an autoimmune disorder. And generally, you're going to find little circular patches throughout. And then with telogen inclusion, one of the examples would be when after having a baby. You go into postpartum hair loss, and we're going to talk about that a little more, where the hormones that it takes to sustain the fetus actually cause the hair loss. Hair looks like I'm telling you guys, you're not going to see through me. Mama was a glass maker. You better come over here. Come on. I want you to see everything. Okay. Um, when you have telogen effluvium, you can shed the hair, but then what happens, once you shed the hair away, then there's a problem with that hair actually regrowing like it should, or shedding prematurely. So you stay in that shedding cycle. So you develop this thinning, and most of the time the pattern is along the front hairline, and it can be mostly in the where we have less follicles. We have less follicles. We have more follicles in the crown, or we have more in the front hairline. Where do we have more in it? The crown or the front hairline? Front hairline. 
You're fine because you are not a cosmetologist, so you get all kinds of excuses. So no worries, I love you. Okay, stylists and students. I'm not gonna give y'all another F today, okay? Okay. <laughs> stylists. Crown. Why? Because okay. God is wonderful and he made us unique. I mean, we're uniquely made. And what happens, we have blessed. Like we have singles, single units with single hairs in them. Where in the crown, you, your follicular units may have more. We're going to talk about that a little more. But we're going to talk about that more on Monday when all of our professionals are in the room. You want to know how to fix your problem. You want to know how to recognize it. You want to know where to go to have your problem treated. So we don't want to put a lot of this into you as far as the science portion because it's going to get or the um, portions that we need to leave to the cosmetologists and the professionals because it's going to get uh, a little bit frustrating and you're going to be all confused. I'm going to be stuffing things in your mouth and you just oh, you want to make sure that you get what you need. All right. Okay. Let's go to the next image. Okay. Let's talk about you were here today to talk about the untold story and the untold story is external follicular hair loss. The first one we're going to talk about is short hair syndrome. These are disorders that I coined in this very institute. You, you can look up short hair syndrome. There may be some copies, but please let me know because I have uh, copyrights on all of my stuff. So, uh, but you usually will find my name associated with it. The next one is follicular epidermis alopecia. Alopecia is what? Right, it's balding. So, and we're going to talk about short hair syndrome first. Let's short hair syndrome. Why are we calling it short hair syndrome? Short hair syndrome, I'll describe it to you. It's a vicious cycle of hair growth and hair breakage. The hair grows. How many times have you said, my hair just won't grow? How many times have you heard someone say that? How many times have you heard someone say, my hair grows to my shoulders and stop? How many times do you hear, you know, we all say, oh, it's just won't, my hair won't grow in the back. <laughs> okay. We are not going to scratch our scalp in this room today. What we're going to do is we're going to teach you what to do. The guilty one was like, is it she saw? Okay. We're going to apply pressure and then we're going to rotate the tissue because scratching will cause microscopic tears, which will harm our superficial layer, which that top layer of what? Which one are we talking about? Yeah. Epidermis. And if we rub it, it's going to cause bruising. If you scratch it, it's going to cause tears. Okay, so what we want to do, what we want to do is we want to apply pressure. So you find that itchy spot. We're all going to practice. We're going to find that itchy spot. I know we feel like we're in the first grade. We, gotta get, we just got to do it. Because everyone in this room has scratched their scalp before. So if you have not scratched your scalp, don't put your hand up there. If you've ever in your life scratched your scalp, and I'm just never in your life. Not even when you were a baby. Not even when you were in the womb. Okay. Well, we'll put our finger on our scalp. <laughs> Not even when you, before you were thought of. Because you scratched it. Anymore. Okay. We're going to apply pressure. And then we're going to rotate the tissue. Those of you at home out there, I, I see your numbers out there. Just do it. And what that's going to do is called, it's called pressure massage. And it's going, it feels good. Yeah. But what, and don't be so light. Because when y'all, Scratch, you're digging. So when you want to show my patients this, this little technique, they go, I'm like, okay, let me just watch you scratch. You know, if you can dig, you can apply pressure and rotate the tissue. Because what we want to do is we want to get some instant relief, but we don't want to damage. Okay? So that's going to be crucial. So I just stopped for that break because I saw someone scratching. So if I see you scratching, I'm going to tell you, don't do that, and please practice what we just learned. Okay, with short hair syndrome, it's a vicious cycle of growth and breakage. The hair grows, it breaks, it grows, it breaks. The follicle is functioning, it's done its job, the hair is emerging from the mouth of the follicle, but it's not getting long. So there's a big difference between growth and obtaining length. So if your hair has made it above the mouth of your follicle, that means that little pinhole the hair emerges from, if it's on top of your scalp, then it's growing. Can we all remember that, guys? Stop saying that my hair is not growing. What you want to say, if it's staying that length, I have lost the ability to obtain length 
with this hair in the back of my head or in the crown of my head. It's growing because it's above my scalp, but it won't get long. Deal with the specifics. Recognize the problem because if you don't, you will be all over the place. Oh my goodness, it's stress. It's nutrition. I went on that diet. Oh, that man, a man, a man. We would go on and on and we would determine all these things are causing our hair loss or our inability to have long hair, but it's really because we have caused there are other problems. And we're going to get to that in a minute. Okay. That's short hair syndrome. Collectively, a group of symptoms, you'll notice like dry hair. There are stages to short hair syndrome. We're going to go through those stages. Dry hair. You'll notice dry hair. You'll notice it won't hold a style. You'll notice that I put moisture on and it just seems to suck it up and it just goes right away. How many of you said that? Everybody in here is such perfect hair. Everybody's holding their hand up. Super duper. Hey, yay. Praise the Lord. Okay. Next one is follicular epidermis alopecia. Follicular epidermis alopecia, that is a type of alopecia is what? Oh, <laughs> Love you guys. You're listening to me. Okay, follicular epidermis alopecia is a form of alopecia. Now, let's start with the first part of that name, follicular. It's a part of the follicle. What part of the follicle are we dealing with when we deal with follicular epidermis alopecia? A part of that follicle is the, and we don't spend that much time on it because we're going to save this for Monday for our cosmetologist. So they'll come back in, they'll be armed and ready to take care of your hair. Okay, but the first, the part is the mouth of the follicle. So the follicle itself, you have a what we call a follicular unit, which is a macropore, and then we have the micropore, which is the follicles. Every little follicle, every little hair has one, every follicle has one hair, one hair. When you look at your scalp, you say, look like there's several hairs growing from my follicle. You're actually looking at the mouth of your follicular unit. You only have one hair per follicle, okay? So what happens with the mouth of that follicle that hair has to emerge. If it does not emerge as it should, it's either an internal or external, and that's why you have the examinations from your trichologist. So it's a part of the follicle, that's why we say follicular. Epidermis, why, are we call, why do we have epidermis in there? Because it's in which layer? I want this top layer, which is the Epidermis. There you go. And it's okay if you don't remember. You, excuse, you guys are not cosmetologists. The cosmetologists want to get twisted switches. Okay. So follicular epidermis and then it's alopecia because it's baldness. Now let's go back and let's take a look. Oops. Uh -oh, do that. Okay. Let's take a look at some of the baldness. Baldness right in the crown. So one of the things you would say, stress, diet, nerves, um, hormones, medication, but no, this is FEA, follicular epidermis alopecia, FEA, FEA, same here, same there, same there, all of it, that's your untold story. So let's go back and let's now take a look. So what's the cause? What's some of the causes of these problems? Scalp damage, and we're looking at this particular one, which is FEA, this is a microscopic view, 50X, FEA, and you're looking at the mouth of the, this is the follicular unit, remember we talked about that, that's the macro pore, look what's happening there, and those are pollutants solidified around the pore, this is damage to the skin, first degree skin damage, what, this, what does that mean? We have the top skin damage, and then down here, short hair syndrome, so short hair syndrome, the cortical fibers are exposed, poor elasticity, Strand is separating, it is broke. And the hair is going to break. So hair damage, strand damage. Let's talk about follicular epidermis alopecia for a minute. Now, I'm just going to give you this diagram. I really hesitate to put this in, but because I really want you to be empowered to understand, when your trichologist or your cosmetologist starts to speak to you about this, I want you to understand what's going on. Okay, so when we look at this image, we're looking at the hair emerging as it should, but we're looking here, the hair shed, we're looking at the scalp. Now let's go down and let's find, that's a typical blockage. 
around the follicle is what we're trying to demonstrate. So you've got tears along the mouth of the follicle, and the follicle is blocked, causing the follicular epidermis alopecia. So when that hair, follicular epidermis alopecia is a type of baldness that comes from skin damage, the follicle has lost its ability to allow that hair to emerge from its mouth, simply put, okay? All right, so let's take a look microscopically. This is what I look at when I'm doing analysis, all right? You see, y'all have seen this under the microscope, so now you get to see it again. You won't get to see any other school. Just go on and blog about it, tweet about it, Facebook about it. We're a new school, guys. I'm so excited. Um, I just want to tell this quick story and I'll move on. One of the things that I realized, one of the things I thought years ago, I thought that, okay, I'm a cosmetologist, now trichologist. Let me have you go through the schools, and when you finish whatever school you go to, because I didn't have time for schools, whenever you finish that, then you come to me, and I'll train you. That's a problem. That's just like letting somebody grow up in a house a certain way, and then you decide you're going to train them when they become an adult. Too late. Too late. They got all the bad stuff in them. So what I want to do is expose my students to this. So they don't go back, go out and say, your hair is breaking. What is it? Girls, probably your nerves. You never say that, <laughs> would you? No. Okay, you're going to get an F. <laughs> Let's speak up. Oh, <laughs> smiling. They're saying no, and she's just looking. I'm like, oh, we're going to give them a test on this, okay? And the structure's in the back. Okay. All right, so let's talk about follicular epidermis alopecia for a moment. What you saw in the last image was just a diagram. This is the real deal. So what you see here, you see the mouth of the follicle dilated and torn. It's extremely polluted. This, what, this looks like waxy substance. This is basically a dense wax around the mouth of the follicle. And we peel it back and look what you see. Now let's look at this image. Can y'all see? Because I'm telling you, mom wasn't a glass maker. You can't see through me, I'm thick, okay? All right, so this particular side, you're going to see a hair. Now, what do you see? I already told you the answer I'm going to ask you. Okay, what is this? This is a hair. What do you see here? You see the same substance that was peeled back here. You see it around this mouth of this follicle and this hair. So this is what we call an ingrown hair. So the hair, the blockage is there. I'm showing you this diagram because it's very real. It's not something you're imagining. So what happens? What are some of the symptoms you find? An itchy scalp, flaky scalp, tender scalp. Those are the telltale signs because there's no room there for everything to emerge. So we're just kind of sandwiched. This particular one, the ingrown hairs, is where it's sandwiching between your epidermis and the solidified pollutants. And we're going to talk about what those pollutants are in just a second. But that's the real deal. Hair sheds away, pollutants fill up the mouth of the follicle, and they become blocked. Pollutants cause a blockage around the mouth of the follicle, cause the hair to become ingrown. Okay, so let's look at follicular epidermis alopecia. Okay, we're looking at stage one. So stage one, you can only see with a microscopic eye. You can't see with the naked eye. Stage two, look what happens. How did that diffuse? Stage three, and we're just moving around the head. Stage three, and what does it look like? The reason I did this, because what does this look like? Alopecia areata. It's the pattern of alopecia areata. And stage four, this is what you have. Short hair syndrome. Let's talk about, did you need me to go back? I know, it's, I, know I don't want you to throw up. I don't want you to be like, oh my goodness, wait a minute, what did she say? You're not going to have to use this. Now, we're going to spend a lot more time on the stylus, but I want you to be aware. You're not going back to your job and have to perform this. I just want you to be aware so you can differentiate. You can say, okay, I will never say it's just stress or diet. I'm going to explore all the things I need to explore before I say that. Okay, now, here we are, short hair syndrome. Remember we said short hair syndrome is a vicious cycle of hair growth and hair breakage. You've lost the ability to obtain the potential length and fullness, sometimes both. The hair grows, but it doesn't what? It doesn't obtain what? Absolutely. And this particular type of breakage comes from which layer? 
Epidermis, ooh, yay. Boy, what's up? You had someone here to say it, Susan. <laughs> I'm gonna get you guys. Okay, now, ep follicular epidermis alopecia happens within which layer? Uh, bottom layer. No, no, you're okay, you don't have to answer. We're gonna get see if we'll get us. Epidermis, there we go, Sharon. Let me get that microphone over there, I'm hard. Well, let's talk about the short hair syndrome. So we're going to stay focused now. What I wanted to do here, I wanted to give you a layer and let you see what happens with the layer. Now, we have three main layers to our strand. Epidermis. Oh, you okay? Really? I don't want you to try to answer that. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, cuticle cortex and medulla. The most superficial layer of the layers would be the cuticle. That's the one that's the top. That's the one. It's really, when I say superficial, it doesn't suppose to shed away, but it's our sentinel. It's our guard. It's the one that sits on top and protects. Well, what happens when that becomes overexposed, and we're going to talk about why short hair syndrome occurs. When that becomes overexposed, we're going to find that strand begins to do what? We have the strand separation. We have the layer peeling, because you can look at this, you can go, no, that's not strand separation, that's two different layers. But look here, I didn't just do a paste up, I didn't do a copy and paste. This is actually strand separation. That's a group of layers that are peeled away. Layer peeling looks like little lint type pieces. So sometimes you'll, you know, I have a patient to come in and they say, you know, I should just be bald because I, my hair is just coming out and coming out. Well, your hair is probably losing its top layers and what happens, the strands get thinner and thinner and thinner. So sometimes you'll see thicker hair at the scalp, but really thin stringy hair on the ends. That's because you've developed short hair syndrome. And that's what's happening here. Your cortical fibers become exposed. That's when we're in real trouble. Because when the cortical fiber becomes exposed, you have things like your strength bonds in the cortical fibers. When those strength bonds are exposed, then it's like a rope. It's just like that one string left and that was it. Okay, so let's go back because I, I let's talk about why these things happen. Because let's see if I left some space for that. Okay, but I want to show you this first. Now these are the stages of short hair syndrome. Again, microscopic view or with the naked eye, looks like we have plenty here. Most people never come in when their hair is like this. Now nowadays, it's, it, you know, since it's become more popular, the clinic, the institute, we realize people will come in and say, well, you know, my hair is really dry. So I'm like excited to see them because I don't want you to wait until it's yeah like stage four or three, but that's stage one. Stage two, what do you notice in stage one? On the ends, why is it on the ends? And we're gonna go back to one in a second, but why is it on the ends? Because the ends of the hair, what you're finding is those ends are the oldest hair on the head. So what happens, it has more wear and tear. So now you have a situation where your hair has grown out from your scalp, it's obtained some length, but you're losing layers. Now, how did it get that long before it broke? Because of the texture. Texture deals with the size of your strand. If your strand is coarse, you have more layers, more cuticles that you can spare and before it starts to look thin. <coughs> but if you have fine hair, that's the end of it. That's why with short hair syndrome, the most likely candidate for short hair syndrome is extremely kinky hair and extremely fine hair. What's the most or fine hair? The and the second most likely is fine hair. You can have straight hair and fine hair because ladies with naturally straight hair they suffer with short hair syndrome as well. I have patients like that. So you can have fine hair whether you are um, naturally straight or you have a, a medium degree of wave pattern to your hair type wise. You can still have, suffer from this. But generally, you can keep that hair longer if you have a larger strand. Okay, stage three. And let's talk about stage one. What does it look like? You said we're gonna double back. Stage one, what do you notice with short hair syndrome stage one? And we have to go back to FEA in just a minute. But stage one, you notice your hair is dry. Style retention is a problem. You put product on and it won't seem to hold it. It seems to dissipate. Those kinds of things, that's your stage one but you still have hair. No real changes. 
What happens in stage two? It brings over stage one, all those symptoms, and then it gives you some more. It start, you start to thin. You start to have a strand that changes size. So the texture, which meaning the size, becomes smaller. So you have that problem. Then we look at stage three. Stage three is when they really come in to see. Because with stage two, they're like, oh, okay, I just need my ends trim. Does that look like just ends to you? I don't think so. No, that looks like more than just ends. Stage three is where you have long, short, long, short. You lost the ability to obtain length and fullness. You've lost the ability. Stage four, what's the difference in stage four? Look at what we're beginning to see. Now remember the hairs grow in follicular units. The follicular units are in little, they're little bunches all over the scalp. We have over 150,000 strands growing from our scalp. So there are units, you can have two, three, four, five hairs follicles with one hair each in each unit. It's all genetically linked. Well, what happens when you get your hair is short enough, like with a male or women who cut their hair really short, what do you do? You see their scalp, right? So if your hair breaks short enough, you're going to see the scalp. So you would think, okay, that's baldy. But when we look microscopically, we can see that that hair is there. It's just broken really short right at the mouth. That's a problem, okay? So let's talk about, let's go to the next. Let's look at short hair syndrome again. What is this? This is poor elasticity. We have cosmetic pollutants built up around the hair. That hair will break if it's not treated. And these are just some more images of short hair syndrome. This is one of our patients, a really old picture. She allowed us to use. The reason I wanted her because she has both follicular epidermis alopecia and pockets of it, and then she has mostly short hair syndrome. And there she is after. So let's go back quickly, and then we're going to go to questions. Okay, let's look at FEA. Now, how do we get, how, how do we know this may be happening? We know when the manifestation of it, we know that um, we see the balding, we know there's a, some type of alopecia or balding. But when you have an itchy scalp, an itchy scalp is like a headache. It says something's wrong with a headache. You may be sleepy. Hungry, tired, something more serious. With follicular epidermis alopecia, and you have an itch with your scalp, it may mean that um, your scalp is dirty, dry, irritated by something, or something more serious. An itch is not to be ignored, and an itch is not only to be scratched. Okay? It gives us scratches a form of massage. It feels good. I mean, I remember we were back in the day when I went and worked in a salon. It was like, okay, scalp scratch 50 cents. It was on the menu. <laughs> we scratch the scalp, lift the dandruff. So we can really work that up, and then we're going to really, really clean it out. Pour that sea breeze in. <laughs> you know, it was horrible. But we did it. And you would have people come back in two weeks, and they would be like, my scalp is too sore from last week, last two weeks, so I'll be ready next week, baby. I'm thinking, how do we torture people like that? We didn't know. So I, I, I conducted a study called Scalp and Skin. When I did that, I was able to uncover why we itch, why we lose hair, why, what happens with our skin. This is crucial. So we're going to really dive into that on Monday. I'm so excited. The stylists are coming in, filling up my room, and we're going to have even more. We're going to have to get more chairs. So stylists, email all of your stylists, send them on Facebook. It was kind of confusing because this, both of these, and I'm so glad you guys are here today. I'm so glad folks are online uh, watching me because we have two events in Women's um, History Month. I thought initially I was just going to do this one, but then I realized if we don't get the cosmetologists involved, forget about it. Forget about it. Remember the movie? Forget about it. <laughs> anyway, I'm a movie person, and I love to movie trivia, but none of you knew the movie, so we're not going to worry. Okay, so one of the things that we have to keep in mind, if our stylist don't, won't get this, then we can forget about it, and our, we are, it, we're not going to be able to get the help we need. The stylist will be frustrated, and will be frustrated as well, so it's important for us to make the connection, so that's why I did both seminars. Okay, now, with FEA, itchy scalp, flaky scalp, tender scalp, don't ignore it. The first thing you want to do is start shampooing your hair. 
just shampoo on your hair. In order to keep a healthy scalp, what? we have to have a healthy, healthy epidermis, right? So we need a clean, acidic, stimulated, hydrated environment. How do we do that? Clean, we want to shampoo. The scalp sheds its dead cells every day. It's on a continuous basis. So about three days, we start to get a buildup. Okay? We start to get a buildup of just regular scalp pollutants. After seven days, it's just filthy. And we were shampooing every two weeks, and we're like, I don't know what that is. You know? We were doing that, and, and it's just not good. All we were doing is giving ourselves a headache. But um, we're thinking, well, I'm black, and I have, and I'm, you know, my white sister's out there. Just bear with me on this one. I'm black, and oh, I'm talking about online. She's like, where are the white folk at? No, online. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yes. Room full of people of color. Um, there, we just thought we have dry hair, so how can we possibly shampoo that often? I literally had someone sit on the front row of my seminar and said, "I can't do that." I, I'm like, I know it. You know, but we have to be clean. It's not like saying we can't take a bath. Well, we have to look at what we're shampooing with. We have to look at all those things, so we can have to say, okay. And this is not a commercial for Lisa Beer products, the cleansing, clarifying, balanced shampoo, which is 5.5, 4, 4, 4, 5, 5, 4, 5 pH. It's not a commercial about that. <laughs> Online, you can get it at lisaackbeer.com. <laughs> nothing like that. This is all about cleaning your scalp properly. So you want a clean environment. Now, we have so many. How many have heard of No Poop? Co-wash. How many have been on YouTube? Okay, you've heard co-wash and nail poop if you've been on YouTube. I love you too. Okay, so co-wash says don't shampoo every time. Just run conditioner through because it will help to keep your hair soft and detangled. And this is true, but they didn't talk about how dirty your scalp gets. No poo says don't shampoo at all. Just conditioner. And they're really having these debates online about shampoo, how you can get clean with conditioner. That's just like saying you can take a bath with lotion. You can't do it. So you have to clean. So the first thing you need a clean environment. Now clarify, put at a pure natural state. Why do I believe that's so important? Because your conditioners, everything else works better when you clarify. I just did 5,000 steps on my Fitbit, yay. But I wasn't walking. <laughs> Okay, but um, you clarify, you put it a pure natural state to strip, it's going to take what's natural and what's unnatural. And that's what you don't want. So you want, and how do you really protect your hair from that? You look at the pH. You want to stay within the range of the pH of your hair and scalp, which is what, what is the pH of hair and scalp? Very good, very good, okay. 4.5 to 5.5. Thank you, dear. Because the students would not speak up. We'll have to talk later. We got medium. We're going to talk with all of y'all later. Okay, because you guys get this and you're so smart and you get all these great grades, and I want you to speak up. And some of these folks could be your clients later. Okay, so that's what we want to say with the pH. So that's what I mean by acidic pH, a more clean, acidic environment. Our scalp, because of the acid mantle, and like I said, I'll go into this more with the cosmetologist on Monday, we have a pH of 4.5 to 5.5 within our scalp because of the acid mantle, which is a secretion from the sebaceous glands and the oil, the oil glands, which is sebaceous glands, and the sweat glands. It gives our hair and scalp a pH. If we don't disturb that basic chemistry, that basic thing of our hair, then we are, it's easier for us to clarify. When we do that, when we drop below, we get too acidic. And some of these things, how many heard of apple cider vinegar? Apple cider vinegar, we heard of it. And how many use that? Or ooh, okay. how many of you, you heard that it was good to clean with? Because apple cider vinegar breaks up and breaks down, but it does not clean. So it settles back down. The debris settles back down on the scalp. So it doesn't clean. Um, so we want to... Do a, you have a clean, acidic, and it's, the pH is way too low. That's another thing. So you do dry out, and you're trying to protect your hair from drying out. 
Then we look at a hydrated environment. We have to protect it. That's where the protecting and preserving comes in. So when we protect and preserve our scalp, what we're basically doing is we are keeping, we're staying out of overheated dryers. Like some of you have natural hair, you do these rod sets, and you're in a dryer for an hour and two hours. Once your scalp dry natural, folks, I have to pick on this a little bit because you think I'm natural. And why is my hair coming out? Why is my scalp doing this? And those reasons is because of what we do to our hair and scalp. So we have to protect and preserve it. So we have to hydrate. And one of the ways we can hydrate our scalp is we can take oil, and it doesn't hydrate. Oil doesn't, but it seals in the natural moisture, and it will seal in your scalp. You say, well, I have dry scalp. After you shampoo your scalp, have you ever washed your face and you felt how soft it felt? And then if you didn't hydrate or if you didn't put oil on it, it would just dry out? Well, your epidermis can hold 20% of its weight in moisture. So if you seal in, even if it's damaged, you can hold that weight. So it will hydrate. The other way is to not overheat your dry, as I mentioned. And also, it's just dry climates. You have to be careful. So you don't pollute, you don't dehydrate, but you have to just... Clean. If you clean and you have an acidic environment, then you will really offset a lot of those dehydrating things. Stimulated. You want to, mis how many of you have had to share scalp shampoo with the nails or shampoo brush? It's wrong because it creates what tears, the microscopic tears. You don't want to try to get whatever's in the mouth of your follicle out with the shampoo brush. Scratching is a form of massage, and it'll feel good for a minute, and then it causes damage. So you want a clean, acidic, stimulated, hydrated environment. So when you massage, well, no, don't move your finger. Move your scalp. Oh. Let's try it again. Move your, put your, press your yeah, finger. I thought I was moving. You're moving your finger. Oh, so. I want you to just move your scalp. So pressure. So you're pressing in, and you're rotating the tissue. There you go. Pre rotate the tissue. Don't rotate it. Want to try it? Let's do it. Yeah. Press in. Now just rotate the skin like you're pushing the skin. Don't move your fingers. You're doing this. Do this. See that difference? That's it. And what you're going to do is you just basically want to give it a little massage. It's called pressure massage. So you want to massage with the balls of your fingers, not your nails, and you want pressure massage. Okay? Okay, so let's go to questions. Okay, we've got questions. Are we ready? I want to show you this to this in a little bit one after five months later. And that looks like what you would think is female pattern baldness. Okay, questions? No, it looks like it. And that's what we want to point out. The pattern of baldness is a pattern. Doesn't mean, that means that it's usually in the crown. You're going to find that. You can find it on the hairline. You use it diffuse. This is more, and really, this is a little bit more because diffuse is more of this. She's got some problems here. And there are things we work with, like this would look like, okay, that's scarred. So she's not getting that hair back. But that's why you have a mouth of the fault. You have the microscopic view. So the microscopic view can help you to determine whether we have scar tissue or we just have blockages. And the blockages come from the pollutants. And let's talk about the pollutants as y'all get your questions together. Okay, you ready? Getting them together? Okay, and I want a question from eight, one question from you guys over there, students. Get together. I want one question from the group. Since Sharon does not want to talk, I will make her the spokesperson. Okay. All right. Um, let's talk about the categories of pollutants. We have three categories of pollutants. One, scalp pollutant, dead skin cells, that's scalp pollutants. Cosmetic pollutants, that's why you want a clean product. And Angie, thank you. Angie said environmental, cosmetic, scalp, environmental. Those pollutants will solidify and then they create this dense wax. Now, depending on how dense the pollutant is and actually how the size of the strand, the texture, that determines well, like, whether it will emerge or not. So what we have to do is we look at the pollutants. Now, she had some scarring, but small pockets. In a follicular unit, you can have a scar on one follicle. You can have debris from that scar overlapping on another follicle, but that follicle is alive, just buried alive. You can have um, other follicles that are emerging. Or you can have debris on all of the follicles in the unit. 
So the goal of our, the treatments is to open the follicle. If there's a hair there, it will emerge. If there's not a hair there, it's not going to be there. That's a defense mechanism to put that scar in. The body's just not going to let you kill it from the head down. It's going to scar up. It's going to cause a problem. If you damage your skin, first degree, second degree, when you had a burn, when you bled and oozed, you sat on the ground and itched so much when you dug your scalp, and yeah, you're going to get a scar tissue and it's going to destroy everything in its path, hair follicle included. Okay? All right, so questions. We're ready for questions. So make sure I've got enough in. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bolton. Mr. Bolton. I have a question. Sure. Just um, one of our students. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an like traction alopecia. I know okay. a lot of the ladies and some guys wear braids. Can you kind of touch on Oh, we need a microphone. <laughs> Come on, pretty girl. Because <laughs> we want to hear it online. They want to hear this question online. You have a question? Okay, if, if you got rope, you got, you got enough cord. Okay, your question? Yes, I was wanting to know if you could touch on the um, traction alopecia. I know a lot of the ladies and some guys do wear uh, braids, mm -hmm. and they do get the traction alopecia along with a hairline. Could you kind of touch on that? Absolutely. Let's just so we know, traction alopecia it occurs when the follicle, the mouth of the follicle, is pulled to the point where the mouth of the follicle is pulled to the point where the actual tears are, occur and the follicle becomes dilated, so the hair is being pulled literally from the scalp. So traction alopecia can be temporary, that's with braids, locks, weaves, sew-ins, very popular. Um, so what happens, you're pulling it beyond its elasticity, and one or two, several things could happen. One, you could lose the actual hair, it could break right at the scalp, and that's the one, that's the best thing could happen. Or you could actually damage the follicle. The lip actually can turn inside out, and you pull until you literally damage the mouth in the internal portion of the follicle. And inflammation gets set up, eventually scarring, and you lose it permanently. So traction, you want to be careful. Whenever you're braiding, you want it tight to the hair, not to the scalp. Make sure that your stylist, you let them know, hey, I, it's just too tight. I had a patient today that said, oh, yeah, she has alopecia now. And she, I'm treating her. She's traveling to come to see me. And this particular lady said, I remember when I got my sew in, I would go to bed and my scalp would literally hurt to lay down. And when I would, it would itch like crazy. I could barely sleep because it itched so much. So these are things that are very real. And we're doing that so that we can look like some of these pictures we saw. And you know, those of you who saw the flyer. So traction alopecia can be avoided. If we don't pull, like we find that with braids, weave, um, as sewing, as I said, uh, locks, and let's see, there are some of the others. What are some of the other styles that could cause traction? Twist. Twist, absolutely. Very good. Twist. I'm going to let her hang out in school with you guys, okay? <laughs> All right, twist. Other things could um, cause that. Anything that pulls the mouth of the follicle beyond its elasticity, and it causes the follicle to become damaged and terminal. So it may start in the external, but it can become internal because what? Inflammation can set up and you can lose that permanently. Okay, someone else? Another question? Yeah, there's a question right beside you. Right, uh, to your right, <laughs> to your left. Okay, uh, Dan, is it? Oh, we write, we're just signing in sheet because I want their question to be written by their name. Okay, remember? Dan, is mm -hmm. it uh, because of pollution, of pollutants and I've heard when I was younger that if you have dandruff, it makes your hair your hair is oh. growing. I, you know, have you been following me to uh, on the um, and this brings me to my cyber reading. That's one of the things we're on right now. It's called the the mind, the portion of the book. It's on the mind, and one of the things we have a list of things that are wrong, that are negative, that we shouldn't think, that we that are just wrong, and that's one of them. My hair grows better when it's dirty. People actually believe that. So, you know, we can laugh about it, but it's just the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what's the untold story. So to answer your question, no, your hair doesn't grow when it's dandruff. What grows in dirt? Plants. Our hair is not going to grow when it's dirt. Okay? So we don't want that. Yeah. And yeah, there is the even the live portion. 
I don't know that where I went, why I went there, but yes. Well, it, it was something told to me when I was young. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's the one of the things in the book I talk about. These are things we brought from childhood up, and we're just holding on to them. My mama said it, and that's it. You just don't know. You don't have hair like ours. You have good hair. And that's the last, first thing I hear. So the dandruff piece, not all flakes are equal. You can have a flake. The flake can be cosmetic. It can be scalp. We're going to go back. We're going to take a look. It can be cosmetic, scalp, or environmental. So let's go back and look at some flakes under FEA. Now, anytime, and we'll do more of this with the cosmetologist. This glow, all of this is cosmetic. Only thing that's scalp is transparent. Dandruff, by definition, is an excessive peeling of the scalp. The scalp should shed, but when it becomes excessive, then it becomes labeled as dandruff. All right? So, no. Dan not all flakes are equal. Your hair doesn't grow better when it's dirty. That's all just wrong, and we need to know that. And when your scalp is flaky, then we need to be really careful to keep it clean. We want to be careful to keep a clean environment. And apple cider vinegar is not going to do it. Another question? Back there. We have a cosmetologist with a question. Thank you. Yay. Let's give our cosmetologist a hand. I just love them. And we're just building a great relationship. Okay. When it comes to, I've always heard that dandruff was contagious. You can have infectious dandruff. You can have, it depends. It depends on what's going on with the body systems. Because if you have a dandruff associated with a fungal problem, a bacterial problem, yes, it can be contagious. So absolutely, that is something to know. And that's why the first thing, in order to find out what type of, you who think dermatologist, to find out what you have, what type of flake this is, you think dermatologist because it's a flake. But you really need to see a trichologist, one using a handheld microscope, so that you, they can di differentiate. You want to know if this is dandruff, or if it's a flaky cosmetic, or if it's just environmental. And you do want to know, we have a wood slam we use, and it, it will, if that pink scalp will have a certain tone to it, then you may have to see a dermatologist, but we want, you want to let your trichologist make the recommendation. First, your cosmetologist. Once your cosmetologist makes the recommendation to a trichologist, then we want to determine whether we need a dermatologist, endocrinologist, primary care physician. At that point, based on what we're seeing, we will determine where you should go. And that's why Monday is so crucial, because I really want to see more cosmetologists, especially in my city, in trichology. Okay? Another question. Second, two-part. It's also true that if you don't have dandruff, you don't put oil on your scalp. That's not true entirely. Because we want to, we want to think in terms of proactive and not reactive. We, don't, we want to make sure that we don't just react to something. We want to make sure we prevent you know, and that's what we want to do. So when you have a change in environment, like a dry environment, just like with lotion, you know it's going to be dry outside. You know it's winter. Oh, my hands dry out in the winter. So you put in lotion on as soon as you get out. And you know when I get out of the shower, I'm going to be dry. So you put lotion on. You want to prevent that problem. So you can put oil, but you want to think about oil. The way you determine an oil not if it pours or not. No, if you take a small amount of it and you rub it on your back of your hand, it should go into the skin, and then it should feel, just look shiny, and you should see a nice, it should feel pretty good, feel nice and smooth, but you shouldn't have a really heavy sticky. Now, if you have a heavy sticky, you've either used too much, or that is not skin friendly. So you can oil your scalp white to seal in the moisture, to seal in, just so you can prevent the dryness, okay? Another question. In the back over here, we have a question. You might have to come a little bit to us, okay? Come over. All right. All right, so guys, let me get back online. So if you guys online have a question for me, I may open this up and be full with questions because I have not paid attention to y'all for a few minutes. Let's see if we can chat. Yes, I do. Okay, now you know I wear readers. Oh, you can't look young with readers, Lisa. I got to get you. Okay, hi, everyone. Someone said hi. What does my hair, okay, hi, why does my hair soak up oil? That's a question from somebody on YouTube. Someone else said hi. So hello, I think it's Chanel, hi Chanel, and for Tamika, she has a question about why does her hair soak up oil? Now first, we have to think about, 
I can't look at it, right? Okay. Um, I have to look at whether or not the hair itself is polluted because when the hair is really polluted, then you're not actually getting the oils on your shaft. They're just kind of sitting on top of the pollutants. So it dissipates quickly. The other reason is because you're extremely dehydrated and you need to hydrate first, then seal the oil because oil does not hydrate. So it's going to feel like you are losing everything that you put on. Also, if you have, you put the oil on, you're trying to get, have a shine, then you may have cuticle damage. So that's why you can have, you may have a problem. Okay, we're going to get a question from here and we're going to go back to our chat. Okay, let me know, okay, if that's um, a good answer for you or if you need to have a comeback question from that. Okay, next. Yes, my name is Rhonda Jackson. Hi, Rhonda. Hi, and I am having hair loss. Mm -hmm. um, I've been going through two of my physicians mm -hmm. um, because taking certain medications and just had some health issues. Mm -hmm. And he has referred me to a dermatologist. So my question is this. Um, do, do you take health insurance if not mm -hmm. then maybe it could be a good idea because if we're losing hair and the dermatologist can't figure it out the doctor can't figure it out then we need something else going on in our hair to make our hair grow so my question is can we file is there if it's not actually something that our dermatologist well, that's an excellent do. question, and I'm sure some odd people are asking that and thinking that. It's not that we don't take insurance, it's they don't take us. Um, insurance companies are really, really funny people. They want to pay for things that are health-related only. In their mind, this is not um, health-related, and I think big different. I think that it is because I believe that this affects a lot of part of part, many parts of our body and our well-being and all that. So they will not, they'll say it's cosmetic. They said it's elective. You know, you're, it's not life-sustaining. It's not going to eventually cause you problems. You can live without hair. So they won't take it. Now, what you what the way around it, patients who are able to get paid for this, any treatments we, we offer, they are because they will go to their primary care physician and they will give them a recommendation and they'll write it in their paperwork. And generally, you can get paid that way, reimbursed. Okay? All right. Another question on someone, or let's go back online. Okay, we have another question. Is egg a good protein for hair? If not, what is? Okay. I love my cyber family, and I have to treat them right because they won't, they won't. They protect me. Okay. <laughs> okay. Egg is a protein, and this is very good. We said years ago we would use vinegar, oh no, not vinegar, mayonnaise and egg. And we would make this treatment for our hair and scalp. Well, this is not something we need to do. Egg is not a good protein for hair to put on top because what it will do, and I think she's asking to put on the hair. The protein for hair? Yeah. If not, what is? Very good. Okay. What you want to look at when you think about putting the egg on your hair, you want to think about how, how hard it is to remove it because it's real important that you use clean products. You want products with a molecular weight molecules that make that product. You want them to be able to go in, do the repair work, and be, then rinse clean. Rinse clean. So you want the hair to feel like hair afterwards. You don't want it to feel all heavy and gummy after you have used your conditioners. So no, egg would not be a good protein for the hair. What I recommend, see, hair is mostly composed of protein called keratin. You want to use more vegetable proteins. I'm not going to get into the naming those proteins. I want you to do your research. And why, the reason I say that is because there are many vegetable proteins that will help and will do well but you want more of a vegetable protein, not an animal protein, and you're gonna find a protein that's gonna have a smaller molecular weight and it's gonna be cleaner. Okay, do we have another question in the audience? Yes. It's very important that you always keep your dead ends fit, Very good. What part of the hair is dead? All of it. All of it, right. 
So let's talk about trimming. I have in my book, Every Woman's Guide to Beautiful Hair, there is a chapter that's called To Trim or Not to Trim. That's the question. <laughs> you can trim for two reasons. One of two reasons. You for grooming purposes. So if you want a look, a precision cut, don't go to your stylist and say, I want a bob, and you don't want them to cut your hair. Not gonna happen. If you the other thing reason why you would trim your hair is because, and this is why your stylist, so stop giving your stylist such a hard time. Your stylist want to trim your hair because they believe that it's going to peel back into the healthier hair. So you have to trim it in their mind. So you have two options with that. You can treat it or trim it. So you either treat it or you trim it. If you don't treat it, you must trim it. If you don't trim it, you must treat it. What we see mostly and with short hair syndrome, we mostly see, I think we have, yeah. We mostly see chronic, what we call chronic split ends. It's split, not just on the end, she's got a complete texture change, but in the body of her shaft, it's split. So you have to cut it literally to her scalp, the stage three, in order to get that hair to stop splitting. Okay, let's go online because we're filling up with questions there, and then we're going to come back to you guys in the audience. Okay. Um, all right, now let's go back. We have greetings. Greetings to you. Do you approve of bentonite clay? Oh, the clays for cleansing the hair. I was wondering if I was going to get a clay question today, and I love it. I just love my, I can always count on my cyber family. They just come right on in with them because they're YouTubers. They are on YouTube. And I'm going to tell you something about YouTube. A lot of women with natural hair were just kind of left alone. We were like, okay, we're not going back to natural hair. Forget it. And everybody was going back to natural hair. Cosmetologists were like, no, we're not going back. And the, and the consumers and the clients were like, we're going back to natural. And then they just got on YouTube. And they said, we'll teach each other. So don't talk about us if we get it wrong. And that's what happens. Now, Let's talk about bentonite clay. Wonderful, actually wonderful. Bentonite clay can break up and break down. It cannot clean. It can't clean. So it can break up and break down a lot of the pollutants, but they don't clean away. So they'll settle back on the hair shaft so you have a certain percentage of pollutants still left on the hair shaft. So the answer would be no, you can't clean with bentonite clay. I think let's try to get one more. Okay. Um, I have seborrheic or seborrheal dermatitis. And she's mentioning the medicated shampoos that she used. She said, I take all to the oils. Uh, to, it takes all of the oils from her scalp. Um, and she followed up with her own shampoo and conditioner. Would I recommend putting oil on her scalp? Well, whenever you have a prescription from a dermatologist, you have to be a little bit care careful with what you're actually mixing with it. Um, oils, oils like we have an oil sheen in a jar. That oil, if you take a small amount, rub it into your fingers and then rub it on, you should be okay. A hoba is another good one. There are other oils that are closer to skin oil that you might it might work, but you will need to use oils because the medicated products will dehydrate. Again, we need to do an examination to, de to determine that, but you can't come here. So I would start out with oils, like you can order my oil chain in a jar. Again, rub it in your fingers till you just have a glaze and spot oil. How many of you growing up, you just literally, we call it greasing the scalp? You're like, okay, you're ready. You just slide on out the door. <laughs> no, we don't want that much. You just need it to be where you need it. It's a support product. So you can use oil because you are gonna dehydrate with most of the Medicaid products. Um, she says she meant what type of oil for your scalp. And I just answered that. And then thank you for answering my questions on protein. Do you have any recommendations on inherited natural black high porosity? Wow, high porosity hair. Well, first, we don't necessarily inherit our porosity. Porosity poor, High, low, porosity comes when the hair cuticle, well, I will say this, take this back. We have certain porosity levels depending on our hair, like really Asian straight, very tight cuticle, 
nothing will penetrate. It's really hard to allow that prompt, the cuticle to open and give you what you need in terms of your porosity. Let's talk about what porosity is first. Porosity is the hair's ability to absorb moisture, to retain and absorb the moisture. So when you look at things like this, when you look at porosity issues, generally that comes from damage to the hair shaft. So my recommendation to equalize your porosity, which is your goal, you want your cuticle to open and close so that you have that nice equal porosity. In order to do that, you need to be careful to make sure you balance your hair. There's a delicate balance of protein and moisture levels within the hair shaft. Your hair needs hydration for moisture. It needs protein for strength. If you have that balance, that's why deep conditioning is crucial. If you have that balance, then you're going to have a tight cuticle, which is going to give you a good porosity, a more equal porosity. We have damage to the cuticle, your cortical fibers are exposed, and you're going to have poor porosity. So... That's what my recommendation is to start with that, and you're going to find that your porosity is going to be equal. Unless you're Asian, you're probably going to have a problem with porosity because of some sort of damage. And generally, just because you're black or because you have kinky hair or because you have dry hair doesn't necessarily mean that you should naturally have a problem with porosity. Usually, it comes from damage here. All right, any other questions? So we're going to be about to end because you guys have been outstanding. Okay. Question. How okay. do you feel about hot oil treatments? And when we're doing the deep conditioner um, under the dryer, what is the time limit? Okay, hot oil treatments. Hot oil treatments were so popular. Oh my goodness, I remember the VO5 that you put the little tube in the bottle and the, and the glass of hot water. Oh, you okay, hot oil treatments, oils are to lubricate and they're very temporary. So they tend lubricate and what they're going to do is give you they're going to seal moisture and they're going to give you some shine but they don't deep condition so you can't use a hot oil treatment in order to deep condition so how do i feel about them i think they're waste because they're just they're going to be um and, and, and you got to be careful because some of those will clog up your pores and you'll have a problem they're not clean so that's another problem because they're so busy trying to give you that cosmetic appearance, that shine, that they're not really, the weight of the product is too dense. So be careful. Deep conditioning, you do, I want to recommend that you do something called a plussing. That's where you actually condition, you actually condition the hair, put your conditioner on, allow, put a plastic cap on, sit in the dryer for say 10 minutes, and then you take the plastic cap off and you reapply. Now how many of you have noticed Whenever you condition, it looked like your hair just literally absorbed the conditioner. Yeah. Like it just disappeared. Well, that's what I call malnourished hair. That's hair that's asking you for more. If it can speak, it would say, I need more, 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 more. So what you need to do is apply more, go back under the dryer, plastic cap back under the dryer, and keep reapplying 10-minute intervals, usually it's good, until your hair stops absorbing it. Now, what, what happens? You sit on a dryer on warm. You don't have to go on steaming, hot, all of that. Because you don't want to open your pores up of your scalp. You got hair and scalp you're dealing with. You want to make sure you raise, put on medium setting for optimum penetration. 60 degrees is what you have. Optimum penetration. So that's it. So you can do minutes, 10 minute intervals. You once you're better, you can even do instant sometimes. But you want to make sure if you have any problems with elasticity, breakage, things like that, dryness, you want it to do plus. Okay, you need a microphone. She needs, she has a two-part. Is it necessary to actually get under the dryer, or can you like walk around with the deep conditioning of your hair with a plastic cap for maybe like an hour? Only if you, even if you had a fever, it wouldn't work. Um, you've got to raise that body temperature. you got to raise that hair, really. You don't want to raise the body temperature. You want to get the indirect heat to come down to your hair and raise the temperature of your hair shaft. So your body heat can do a little bit of it, but you would end up sweating, and then you would end up polluting the scalp. No one is asking me about workout questions. All right, next. I have a question. Sure. Is there a picture up there? Mm -hmm. Stage one, with the hair being dry, you go to stage two. Do you recommend clipping out all the thin hair up to... 
point where it's full. You take all that off, and mm -hmm. that way you'll be working with the thick, maybe dry hair from then on, and you won't get to stage three and four. Spoken like a true stylist. <laughs> Let's just get rid of that hair. We're just going to work this thing out. And that's true, because that is one way to do it. But you know, the problem we have nowadays, and the reason I stopped just cutting it off and starting over, because my, my professor, when I was in school, one of the things she said, I tell all my patients, give me a chance to cut this hair all off, and I'll give you a new head, healthy head of hair. Most people just, they're so afraid. If they have three strings up there, they want you to just, <laughs> you know, they don't want you cut their hair off. So you gotta, you gotta really, you gotta love them into this. I mean, this is huge for them. And so, no, I think you should treat it. Just like I said, you have um, two options. You can trim it away, cut it away, or treat it. And and I just don't. I always tell my patients, we're we're here to grow here. If they tell me cut, yay, snip, snip away. But if they're not ready, don't. They need to be comfortable that they're going to continue to obtain length. And then they'll let you cut it away. And this is what you tell them. You said, okay, you this length, you're comfortable with the length you are now. So allow me, especially people who are transitioning, allow me for every inch that grows, let me cut away a half an inch. Yes. You'll never miss it. They yeah. They'll pause for a minute. They'll go, hmm, let me see. And some of them will say yes, and some of them will say, nope, mm -mm, I want even that half an inch. And so you have to give it to them. And what you tell them then this is your regimen you have to treat. Because some patients, clients, and customers, they want to not treat it, and they still don't want to trim. So it's breaking, and they're like, oh, I know, it's this stress, it's this man, it's these children, it's this job. No, it's because we're not taking care of it. So you have to be assertive as a stylist, and you have to say, this is your regimen every day. It's not a suggestion, it's a mandatory must. And when you talk to them that way, you gotta put your hand on the shoulder sometimes because some people are just really sensitive. And they'll just like, she was so mean. I've had patients that I didn't know this because I'm real assertive. So I have patients that come out and they find somebody else to hug because they were like, get away from her. And they were like, I feel like I was back in school. She was just so old. So I really had to tone it down a little bit because I'm so passionate about what I do. But it's just, you know, we just want them to get it. But yeah, you gotta you gotta really kind of hang in there and try to look at that personality style and see what you're dealing with. Yes, but question another question. Let's see if we have online because they're right there. And guys, I know that probably not. Let's see, oops, that is something. Okay, and we still got some folks watching, and we're getting close to because we're over at at four, so we we've got about thirty minutes. Another question? No, no yes. question. Yes. Oh, here. Okay. Yes, I wondered if you could speak about sulfite free products and sulfite products, as well as uh, speaking on wing warm and lice okay. Okay. in the hair. Okay, well, when sulfate products, these are cleansing agents and surfactants. So these are products that cause you to think the chips bone. And you really need to think about that because let me tell you. These are not products that really are uh, ingredient raw material that harm the hair. What we decided is because the public was so scared of them, we're like, okay, no more. We're not putting those in our product anymore. I, I'm going to, um, and I'm really excited about this. It's something new we're going to be doing. I'm going to have a talk show on the radio. Yay, FM radio. We uh, went through iHeart, and we're going to talk about that a little later. We'll announce all that. And one of the things I'm going to do is I'm really going to have my chemist back on because my chemist can help us with a lot of that and just really talk about some of those studies that were conducted. But no, they don't harm the hair. You need cleansing agents to clean your hair. There are natural cleansing agents that we are working with, but there's so much of a process, and it's going to drive your product up so high because it's hard to preserve them. So we're, we're holding back as long as we can with our batches to see how we can keep the prices low, but it's gonna cost you more. But I don't think surfactants and sulfites are a problem. Personally, I said it, yes, I said it. 
It's not a problem. It's just one of those things where you have to look at the pH. If you don't, if you have a high alkaline shampoo, if you have a shampoo that's too low in um, the pH, you're going to have a problem with dehydration. What is the hair? Dead keratinized cells. You want to protect and preserve them. Okay? It's not going to give you cancer. It's not going to cause all these problems we think is going to happen. Now, there's studies that may support that. Please email me, Lisa at lisaagbeer.com, and I will be more than happy to take a look at it, and we'll have a discussion right on online so that we can talk about it. But I want to be, you got to talk me down. I'm one of those big mouth folks that you got to talk down. I just don't go easy. Okay? All right. Um, you have to, another part to your question, then you got a question. Uh, I, uh, you you, you yield the floor about, to her? Oh, <laughs> oh you want her 